Good afternoon, everybody. This is Dr. Kenneth Candido, the chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology at Advocate Illinois Masonic Medical Center and clinical professor of both surgery and anesthesia at the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Chicago, discussing dorsal root ganglion injection procedures at C2 and C3 to C8. I have no disclosures related to this educational activity and no conflicts of interest. From a point of introduction, we'd like to state that the dorsal root ganglion contains cell bodies of first order neurons, which project an axon from the peripheral receptor and synapse with second order neurons. There is one DRG for each spinal nerve root supplying the posterior aspect of the neck, as well as the trunk and extremities, which we are familiar with. In the, in the face, the function is carried out, <coughs> excuse me, by the trigeminal ganglion. Injury to a dorsal root ganglion can lead to a severe and unremitting and recalcitrant pain of a neuropathic nature. Injection procedures which target the dorsal root ganglion can be used in the treatment of any radicular pain syndrome, such as primary radicular irritation, for example, and other conditions which include, for example, post-herpetic neuralgia. What are the indications for injection of the dorsal root ganglion in the cervical spine? Neuropathic pain, primarily as a result of injury to the DRG by either trauma, infection, inflammation, which can result in the development of a persistent low threshold spontaneous firing of the neurons. Remember, each DRG may have as many as almost 15,000 soma inside the DRG. So it's an extremely potent and compact relay station for sensory information. The C2 nerve root is implicated in the in the production of occipital neuralgia. So pain in the back of the head, which may be more poorly referred as a C2 radicular type pain syndrome. At all spinal levels, neuropathic radicular pain may be diagnosed by a selective local anesthetic injection of the relevant nerve root, primarily modulated by application of some type of local anesthetic and in selective cases by using things like pulse radio frequency treatment, not continuous radio frequency neurotomy. What about DRG blocks? Well, essentially, if you can access the neuroforamen, you can perform a dorsal root ganglion block using local anesthetics and likewise perform a dorsal root ganglion radio frequency using pulsed energy at 42 degrees centigrade. However, you have to always be cognizant of the fact that this injection, especially in the cervical spine, runs very close to a vascular target or structure. In the cervical spine, we've got to be cognizant not only of radiculomedullary arteries, but more notably with the vertebral artery, which runs in the foramen transversarium, directly juxtaposed to the neural foramen. Neurolytic techniques at the DRG, including when we use thermal radio frequency, can result in that uh, phenomenon known as the afferentation pain formation. So we try not to perform continuous energy at the level of the, of the dorsal root ganglion. What are the preoperative considerations for DRG block? A history of physical and assurance that the patient is not taking an anticoagulant medication or a platelet inhibiting medication. They don't have a bleeding diathesis. Typical clinical examination of the heart, lungs, extremities, etc. A review of the allergy history because this technique does involve the use of a non-ionic water-based contrast agent, typically Omnipaic, in many, many cases, 180 or 240. Particularly, uh, we pay attention to that allergy as well as uh, seafood or shellfish because of the cross-reactivity between such allergies and the allergy to iodine-based contrast. Assessing the patient for anxiety and the pain level is important. We need a patient to remain totally immobile during the performance of this technique. Uh, many clinicians will use sedation. I don't use it in my own personal practice for this block, but it's being used with ever uh, increasing frequency in some centers. Uh, if you're going to do a DRG block, you've got to be able to stimulate the nerve. It's a sensory nerve, a sensory relay station, and therefore to be able to sensory stimulate, whether it's just through a paresthesia or the use of a neuromodulatory stimulator, You've got to have some communication with the patient, which is why heavy or deep sedation is not recommended. <laughs> Medications which are to be utilized include 1% uh, lidocaine for the skin and subcutaneous tissues. Uh, Omnipake 180 is typically used. Uh, I use a 27 gauge 1.5 inch needle for 
as a hypodermic for uh, infiltrating the skin and subcutaneous tissues. A couple of syringes, three cc's, five cc's. Extension tubing is very useful because then you can have what's known as an immobile needle, not directly connect the syringe to the needle itself, but rather to the extension tubing. And if you were to move your hand with the syringe, you're not going to displace that needle out of the neural foramen. I use typically for radio frequency, for pulse radio frequency, a 22 gauge, two inch, or a five centimeter needle with a five millimeter active tip. And I think that the five millimeter active tip is very nice. The needle's Teflon coated. And so all the energy is dispersed past the Teflon in an oblate spheroid or a match head like orientation outside of the tip of that needle in a couple of millimeters, about two millimeters in every direction, unless larger cannulas, of course, are used. For lower levels, you can use a 22 gauge 10 to 15 centimeter needle with, for example, a 10 millimeter or 1.5 centimeter active tip. I don't typically use these for cervical DRGs. Resuscitation equipment, of course, is important. So let's talk about the DRG at C2. The DRG occupies a unique position midway between the arch of C1 and C2. The depth of the ganglion is about a middle third of the overlying C1-2 articulation. And of course, we know that the vertebral artery is in immediate proximity to the DRG and overlays the joint. I put the patient in the supine position. However, some individuals would do this with the patient in the lateral position. And that's acceptable if a patient can't lie flat and face up. Rarely will individuals perform this procedure with the patient in the prone position, but it has been described. In the supine position, I turn the head to the opposite side or the contralateral side away from the intended target. So if I'm doing a nerve block on the right side, the head is rotated towards the left side. Bolsters are used to elevate the shoulder blade on the ipsilateral side. The vertebral end plates can be aligned on fluoroscopy and the degree of oblique obliquity is then determined by live fluoroscopic imaging such that the neural foramen is brought into sharp resolution. And I use magnification times one. Now, some individuals use magnification times two. That is also acceptable. Patient here in this graphic is positioned for a C2 DRG. This is a high cervical approach. The patient's supine, the head is rotated away from the foramen and we look for a foraminal view. The patient may also be in a lateral position as I stated, and that's acceptable. I do some of these blocks in the lateral uh, position. This is an AP fluoroscopic view of the C2 DRG with the needle tip overlying the C1, C2 articulation. And this, this is a lateral fluoroscopic view of the C2 DRG approach. So at C2, we localize the DRG midway between the arch of C1 and C2 overlying the C1, 2 articulation. Uh, we use a straight needle coaxial or gun barrel view. Do this, we look straight down the needle from the hub down to the shaft, down to the tip. We must be familiar with the course of the vertebral artery. There's, there's, it must be reconciled because injection of even small aliquots, 0.25 mLs of any local anesthetic will cause a grand mal seizure. And this has been described for many, many decades. And then I use an AP image. Um, I also uh, square the craniocaudal basically with respect to the vertebral end plates. And then I have looked for medial progression of the needle tip observed. Final location, the needle tip should be in the middle third of the overlying C1, C2 articulation. Now, if I'm gonna do um, a neurogram, I'm gonna inject very small amounts, maybe 0.8 to 1.0 mLs of my contrast agent. And then you can either use continual live fluoroscopy or some would use digital subtraction angiography just to be sure you're not in the, in the vertebral artery. If I'm gonna do pulse radio frequency, I perform a sensory stimulation with a frequency of 50 Hertz uh, progressing in 0.1 volt increments to a max of one volt. Stimulation at approximately 0.5 volts indicates that the DRG is in adequate proximity to the active tip of the needle and within the electromagnetic field of whatever lesioning is gonna be performed or in the presence of pulsed RF, not lesioning, but actually the pulsed electrical energy. Motor stimulation is not necessary at this level for obvious reasons. So the safest technique is low dose pulsed RF of the C2 DRG. Now for the lower levels, the situation's a little bit easier, somewhat, because the anatomical views are easy to, easier to reconcile. Uh, in the cervical spine, the DRG is in the most dorsal encephalad aspect of the neural foramen. It's behind the middle third of the overlying facet joint. 
Again, the patient is positioned in the supine position with the head turned to the contralateral side from the target. For the low cervical position, the patient is again supine, the head is rotated away. And some would use, again, a posterior approach or lateral approach. I have used the lateral approach with some great success. And for patient comfort, sometimes I will accommodate them by putting them in the lateral decubitus position with a pillow under the head and the head rotated again away from the side of interest. The vertebral end plates are properly aligned on the fluoroscopy by adjusting the cranial caudat angle. And the degree of obliquity is then determined by live fluoroscopic imaging, again, so that the neural foramen is brought into sharp focus. And here we see a neural foramen, here we see a neural, neural foramen, and here's a curved tip needle advancing towards the cephalad, but not dorsad, should actually be a little bit more posterior part of the neural foramen. And it should be in about the middle third of the overlying facet joint seen on anterior posterior uh, fluoroscopy. And the final position, of course, can be determined by using sensory stimulation. We are, after all, stimulating a sensory relay station or ganglion. <clears throat> the location of the DRG in C3 to, through C8 is the most dorsal and cephalad aspect of the foramen. And again, a straight needle is, uh, it must be coaxial. That means gun barrel or tunnel view to look down the needle directly from the the top of the shaft to the end of the tip. We must be thoroughly familiar with the location of the vertebral artery. And so not only do we do a, an anterior posterior view, we also do a lateral view and a lateral oblique view to determine that in point of fact, our needle is situated in the cephalad and dorsad most area or confines of that intervertebral foramen, which is the expected location of the dorsal root ganglion. On AP view, we should be at about the middle third of the overlying facet then I use small aliquots of contrast, non-ionic, water-soluble contrast, typically 0.8 to 1.0 mLs, for example, of Omnipaint 180 or the equivalent. And that should outline the spinal nerve, give us a neurogram in many, many cases. Sometimes you'll see actually spread into the epidural space, although that is not the intent clearly. Sensory stimulation is performed at a frequency of 50 hertz, progressing in 0.1 volt increments to a max of one volt and stimulation at approximately half a volt indicates that the DRG is in adequate proximity to the active tip of the needle. Motor stimulation from C3 to C8 is undertaken to avoid that we are in the ventral part of the nerve, uh, close to the nerve root itself. We don't wanna stimulate the motor fibers if we can help it. We wanna actually stay on the sensory aspect of that nerve at the dorsal root ganglion uh, exclusively. And then when we perform our pulse radio frequency, that's done for 120 seconds with a maximum uh, tip temperature of about 42 degrees centigrade. If we're gonna inject using local anesthetics, that may be diagnostic as well as therapeutic. I typically use 0.25% bupivacaine for this purpose, about 1.0 ml. And sometimes I add a non-particulate or a soluble steroid like dexamethasone, sodium phosphate, preservative free one to two milligrams total. It's the, uh, the success of the blockade is entirely dependent on safely placing the needle adjacent to the ganglion and away from the ventral motor nerve root. Nerve stimulation, of course, is the sine qua non. It's actually the best way to determine whether or not we're close to motor fibers or not. Now, does the literature support the performance of dorsal root ganglion injection and pulse radio frequency? Here's a study uh, from Dr. Halim and Associates published in 2016, which was to look prospectively and randomized fashion to evaluate the efficacy of percutaneous nucleoplasty versus pulse radio frequency of the DRG. 34 patients, they had radicular pain at a single contained level. They followed the patients up for three months. Here's an oblique view of the needle entry point with the percutaneous nucleoplasty treatment. This was C5 to C6 levels. This is the lateral view. Then the pulse to RF treatment at C6, oblique uh, view of the needle positioning here, and the AP view looking down here for the appropriate placement of the needle for pulse radio frequency of the DRG. Here's another uh, view of the C6, C6 to C7 uh, prognostic blockade here, an AP view of the prognostic blockade of C6, C7. And now you can see on an MRI, which is taken uh, sometime after the procedure, Here's the herniated intervertebral disc at the C5, C6 level right here. And this is before the percutaneous nucleoplastic treatment. And this is uh, after the percutaneous nucleoplastic treatment. You can see the relative sizes of this herniation before treatment with this herniation after treatment. What did they find? 
and they compared uh, percutaneous neuroplasty, nucleoplasty to pulse radio frequency for contained herniated discs at single levels. Well, basically, the the percutaneous uh, nucleoplasty patients reported a trend for faster and more pain relief compared to pulse radio frequency, but the difference was neither statistically or clinically significant. So it's very important that percutaneous nucleoplasty did not outperform pulse radio frequency of the DRG. And so in point of fact, pulse radio frequency of the DRG may have similar efficacy to actually nucleoplasty procedures. Another study published recently by Lee and Fang looking at post RF of the C2 DRG and epidural steroid injections was conducted in 87 patients who underwent pulse radio frequency of the C2 dorsal ganglion and epidural steroid injections using a cervical approach versus only cervical epidural steroid injections in 52 patients. They followed patients up for two years. And what do they find? Well, actually the pulse radio frequency with the cervical epidural steroid injections actually outperformed the epidural steroid injections substantially, both for pain levels as well as for neck disability indices. So not only did they improve subjectively, they also improved somewhat objectively. The total scores of the neck disability index was lower when pulse radio frequency of the DRG was added to the cervical epidural steroid injection, and this is compared to cervical epidural steroid injections alone. So there was a significant difference between the two groups. And if you look here at the same uh, paper, the Kaplan-Meier curve shows that the probability of treatment success here in blue compared to green was much higher in the epidural group with the pulse radio frequency. So when pulse radio frequency was added to the cervical epidural steroid injection, the probability of a success of this treatment was substantially higher. Uh, in fact, in the epidural steroid injection group alone, eight patients were retreated with pulse radio frequency after the failure of steroid injections to provide a, a reasonable and reliable reduction in pain. Uh, in the pulse radio frequency and cervical epidural group, only five patients had recurrent pain uh, after therapy and three patients had a, an additional procedure performed. DRG, and here's another study from the Irish Journal of Medical Science by Ogara and Associates, DRG pulsed RF for chronic cervical radicular pain. Here's a retrospective review of outcomes in 59 cases. It's a fairly large retrospective review. And it looked over a three year period in these 59 patients for pain relief, reduction in the use of, of opioid analgesics and progression to surgery. Here's a, a picture showing the needle position and the neural foramen of the C7. And here's after contrast injection showing a, a neurogram with some spread medially into the epidural space, but not too much. So what do they find? Well, of these 59 patients, 83% experienced a substantial improvement of pain. And of that percentage, at 83%, 67% of patients experienced a reduction of greater than or equal to 50%. That's a fairly substantial, and I would suggest a clinically significant finding. More importantly, that a substantial proportion, three out of five patients, sustained this pain relief for more than one year. So it looks like pulse radio frequency of the DRG actually shows efficacy uh, in this group of patients. And you can see here, this is uh, at six to 12 months, the greater than 50% relief, it's a very, very high. At, um, and then you can look here uh, at less than 50% relief is substantially less. And the patients with no relief was only 10%. Almost 70% of the patients who were taking analgesics, including anti-inflammatories, anti-convulsants, opioids, antidepressants, prior to the procedure, decreased or discontinued their analgesic consumption after the pulse radio frequency. And so it seems that pulse radio frequency of the dorsal root ganglion and the cervical spine is a very useful technique, uh, both for short-term as well as for, for prolonged analgesic efficacy in patients with cervical radiculopathic pain. I thank you for your time and attention to this valuable information. Have a great day.